Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Paul Sweeney. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. From Wyoming, from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, for our audience worldwide, Bloomberg Surveillance on television, on radio, and it is a perfect, perfect August Friday here in Jackson Hole with the backdrop of the political maelstrom, the Democratic Convention. I know you stayed up, Lisa, oh, yeah. and watched the entire, oh, yeah. every minute of it as well, but now we turn to the Powell speech. The key question here is how much can this Fed chair ratify what we're seeing in markets, which is the expectation for a rate cutting cycle after one of the the longest periods without any move whatsoever after a rate hiking cycle by a Federal Reserve in modern history. A question here, can they stick the soft landing and will he give any guidance whatsoever to uh, right. a lot of people who think that it's not necessary? I'm data dependent. I've had 14 cups of coffee this morning. They're data dependent. They're going to get out to the speech today and then on to the September 6th employment report and maybe we stagger to the uh, I believe it's September 21 meeting. <laughs> September 18th, they're going to give a sense September of whether they uh, of whether they actually are going to cut rates or not. A key question that I have is, how far have we already come? Take a look. We are seeing a rally right now in markets after yesterday's sell-off, which is the biggest in two weeks. But what I find fascinating is just that we've seen the two-year yield move so much more than anything else. It is down more than a percentage point from the last time that we were here in Jackson Hole, August right. 26. And you see that move. We're up more than 25 percent since that day on the S&P 500. I'm going to get out front with an essay that I only discovered. Thank you, Peter Orzag at Lazard for this, and that what we're battling with here in the years and years I've come here is we're still coming off the pandemic. Peter Orzag with Robin Brooks at Brookings writing a beautiful essay about do we really know where we are off the pandemic? And that's an overlay not being discussed here, is where are we in that continuum? And just sort of accentuating that overlay where the jobs revisions that we had uh, just earlier this week, the idea of 818,000 jobs, fewer that were added in the year ended in March versus the initially reported. We've got an incredible lineup today. We do have about a six-tenths of a percent gain in the S&P. I want to just get set up with Michael McHugh sitting on set with us, not wearing his hat. He's been told not to uh, Ooh, by HR. Nice. I don't know why, uh, because I think your 10-gallon hat looks absolutely fabulous when you head to the rodeo. Mike, what are you expecting today? Smaller hat this year, maybe only five, six gallons. Uh, we're, we're expecting kind of what you laid out with Tom, the uh, idea that the Fed is, uh, Fed chairman is going to ratify the idea that rate cuts are coming without absolutely promising it or giving any kind of amount. Uh, and I think the markets have basically priced that in. The, the rate right. cuts are coming is what's got the two-year yield lower. Um, but going beyond that, the question then becomes, where do they stop? How far do they go and how fast do they get there? And I, that's something else we probably won't hear today. What's so important here, and Mike McKee's the expert on this, uh, much less so uh, me. The number one question I get here at Jackson Hole, particularly by media, why hasn't there been a recession? Mike McKee, why haven't we had the recession? Everyone except Rafael Bostics predicted since time began. We sent Lisa out shopping. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, it, it, we've had a number of reasons, uh, two things in particular, well, three things in particular. One is the pandemic savings. The people got extra checks during the pandemic and they had this extra money to spend. We've also had uh, some government fiscal spending uh, th with the IRA and uh, the other acts that the Biden administration got pa passed. Most of that money hasn't gone out yet, but some has. And businesses have started committing based on the idea that it's going to 
come in. And then, of course, because unemployment was low, wages were rising. And I know, uh, on the political side, uh, wages have been rising faster than inflation, but nobody really gets that. But people have had enough money to spend. Mm. Well, I will say that when I went shopping, I went shopping in the Atlanta airport because we were late over there for about three and a half hours. So uh, that really is the key place that we want to focus right now. And we are so glad to have shopping expert in the Atlanta airport, Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic, who is with us here on site. Really appreciate you being with us, uh, President Bostic. I want to start with a change in tone that we have heard from you over the past couple of weeks. It seemed like Three months ago, you were not that urgent, uh, urgently feeling like we needed to see uh, lower rates. You've kind of changed recently and really seen the need for it. What's caused that change? Well, I think two things have, have really happened to, to lead for that change. First of all, good morning. It's good to see you all. <laughs> it's good to see it's you. really good to be here. Uh, the, the one change is that inflation has moved a lot faster than I had anticipated. Look, we've, for the last two years, have really been in a mission of getting inflation back to our 2% goal. Uh, we had seen a lot of progress. Early this year, it seemed like it may have been stalling out. I'm really gratified to see that it's continuing back on that pace, and that's a, that's a very good thing. And then the second part is the employment side. So we know that uh, unemployment rates have gone from about 3.4% to 4.3%. That's a big change. Now, it's from super hot to solid, right? So I don't want to make it seem like labor markets are weak. But it really starts to tell me that things are much more in balance than they have been for, for quite some time. And, and that's really uh, a sign that mm -hmm. our policy has done its job. And now we need to start the, the, uh, the path back to our more uh, neutral stance. More than anyone at the Fed, you've had a more holistic view with John Schoen at Stanford, with all the academics you've done in Southern California about racism, about society and all. We're in the maelstrom of a political election. Greg Epp, writing in the Wall Street Journal in the last 24 hours, says the politicians are not practicing economics. How does the Fed get to the September meeting, get to the November meeting, and, and avoid the first Tuesday of November? How do you maintain Fed independence with this crazy economic dialogue we're hearing? So I actually don't think it's that, that hard to, to remain independent. I think for us, the job is to keep our heads down, do our work, read the data, study it, get input from businesses and, and people all over this country to get a good handle about where the economy is, how it's moving, and, and how people feel it's going to move forward, uh, and then use that information to figure out what the, the most appropriate policy is. The worst thing that we can do is not do the right thing for reasons other than this not being the right thing. Right? And to me, I think we must at all times uh, be true to uh, our job is to set up a long run environment for this mm -hmm. economy so that it's, it's got a firm foundation. And that means we can't be focused and pulled into the shorter run issues. So I'm just going to keep my head down. The Fed has a long history of, of doing whatever it takes, whenever it takes. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I expect we'll do, too. You've been uh, criticized. The Fed's been criticized by a lot of people on Wall Street who say you're too data dependent. You're looking backwards too much. I don't think they realize that you're constantly talking to people in your district to get the current lay of the land. So what is that lay of the land? What are CEOs telling you about their plans and their view of demand and uh, business going forward? Well, Mike, you should tell people more often. We spend a lot of time looking forward. That's actually a really important thing. We do surveys. Our, shop, our bank has a lot of surveys that we do asking what's your outlook for the next six months, for the next 12 months, and the like. Uh, we hear a couple things. So one, we hear that the demand for product is weakening, but it's still quite solid. Uh, we hear that businesses are not expecting to expand their workforces in a, pretty, in a very significant way, but they're also not expecting to lay people off. That, that, that is not the mode, that they're really in a, a steady state where they can handle where things are. And their outlook for the next six to 12 months is by and large positive. Maybe a little lower in terms of revenues and profits from where we've been last two or three years, but last two or three years have been record-breaking uh, pretty much in every sector, every industry. So it's a solid picture, uh, and it's one of the reasons why uh, I do think that we've had some space to be patient uh, with our policy moves, and uh, and we'll just have to see whether their outlook plays out. I'm, I'm hopeful that it does. Yeah. Given the problems Lisa talked about earlier with the data and coming out of the pandemic and everything, how certain are you that your data is correct enough that you're not behind the curve? Well, I mean, we try really hard to get 
our view based on the pulse that business leaders are, are showing at every moment. Uh, we talk to folks day to day, week to week, and what, we ask two questions all the time. One, what's your outlook for the next six months? And how has that changed relative to where you were two weeks ago or three weeks ago? We are trying really hard to notice those inflection points so that we can speak to that, we can bring that to our policy table and make sure that we're not behind the curve. Uh, but this, these are turbulent times. As you know, I mean, you all re recover the economy. Uh, Things are happening in unexpected ways in many different uh, venues and many different parts of the economy. And so there is a natural trend. There's always some uncertainty. And we've just got to sort of navigate our way through and do the best that we can to get as much information so we can make good policy. What does gradual mean? <laughs> oh, so that's, that, well, that's a very good question. So, so to me, I think uh, it is taking one step at a time and after each step, looking around to see how the economy is evolving. Okay, what everyone's asking is really, is that step 25 basis points? Is it 50 <laughs> basis points? Does one mean gradual and one not? Um, so, so I would say this. The first step, uh, it will depend on what the next couple data points come in. The next couple of data points come in uh, and inflation is moving and unemployment is staying pretty stable. I think w a move would be on the lower side. Um, but. There's a, there's a narrative that says inflation comes in super hot and maybe we don't move at all. Or that unemployment spikes in an unexpected way and we have to move bigger. I don't want to really be sitting on any one action as my modal expectation today. I'm really going to let things play out. And you know, one of the things I've learned very much in the last uh, four years is that getting too far out ahead of what actually happens uh, just causes me to spend a lot of extra energy that I wind up having to sort of undo and then get to where the reality is. So I really am trying as much as possible to be in the moment and of the moment. Well, markets are forward looking. They're not in the moment. So everybody wants to know, where do you end up? Where do you think neutral is going to end up when you finish your cutting cycle? So I'll say two things on this. Um, one, in the SCPs and the dot plots, we have to put a long run number. For me right now, that long run number is 3%. I think it's a little higher than where it was at the depths of the pandemic. Um, but it's but where that is precisely is unclear. The second thing I would say though is I've really been focused much more on making sure that inflation gets to two percent than what a long run number is. And uh, now that we're close to a, uh, moving on that way, uh, that's a, a question that I will spend a lot more time with my team trying to figure out. Uh, you know, in my building, we we started to have discussions slash arguments about this, and and in my building, I get views ranging from two and a half to four and a quarter, right? That's a large range, and we're going to have to narrow that down. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to a robust discussion that will help me uh, get a sense of where, where I think it is. Two years ago, Jay Powell's speech was eight minutes long. How long do you think this speech is going to be? So, you know, I, I don't get any insights on that. Uh, eight is historically short. a record-breaking short. Um, I'm not expecting we'll break records today, but, but we'll have to see what happens. Rafael Vazdek, president of the Atlanta Fed, thank you so much for being with us. is former Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester. This is the first time that she's joining uh, as a non-Fed member in 10 years mm -hmm. at this Jackson Hole meeting. Uh, Loretta Mester, President Mester, I will still call you that. You've <laughs> always been a thought leader. Uh, how much do you hear more dissent than usual among members at a time where we really are at a pivot? I'm not hearing that much dissent, frankly. I think we're in a good place in terms of where the economy is. If you think about inflation, Look how much it's come down. You know, we're in the two and a half percent range. And the labor market is moderating. There's definite signs of that. But it's not weak, right? It hasn't turned into a strong, you know, weakness coming into it. So we're in a good spot. And now what the Fed needs to do is make sure that it can maintain the momentum of inflation going all the way back down to 2% while keeping the labor market healthy. And I think that's where the focus is going to be. If you remember at the start of the tightening cycle, you know, we had to go very aggressively because policy wasn't well calibrated to where the economy is and where it was going, uh, or was and where it was going. And now 
we want to make sure that, you know, the Fed wants to make sure that policy stays well calibrated right. to the economy. So the discussion now, I think, is about we have a dual mandate. We have to focus on both parts of that. We have to be forward looking. You know, it's where the economy is going, not necessarily where it def- is here today, but where it's going. And that's why I think now it's, it's actually appropriate to really be thinking about, OK, it's time now to enter this new phase where we can start normalizing the policy right. rate. Wall Street and the financial media want specificity. They want certitude. They want single point statements about exactly where we are. Mm-hmm. The reality is just to look at productivity is a capital analysis, a labor analysis, and an all-in analysis, call it total factor productivity. The noise in there to me with the overlay of technology is, is highly uncertain. Do you have any handle of the overlay of productivity and technology's effect on the Cleveland and American economy? Well, I mean, we've seen over history, right, that technology can be very additive to productivity growth, right? I mean, that's kind of the engine of um, an economy that's increasing and having, you know, potential growth rise. Um, But in any point in time, it's very hard to measure productivity growth. Even if we didn't have this big technological innovation of AI, it's very difficult to measure it. So you have to take into account that there's uncertainty around productivity growth. I mean, some estimates say that we're still in a low productivity regime. Um, Other estimates are saying, you know, let's look forward. Maybe we're going to be in a higher. But for the Fed right now, right, that's not sort of the focus. The focus is, you know, are we calibrated well? Um, Is policy calibrated well to the economy? Mike, you've been great on this. She just said they're not focused on productivity. We have to be because business leaders every day are focused on those outcomes in their investment. Well, they've sort of been forced to by inflation and a lack of workers. And they've been forced to put uh, investment into productivity. We'll see if it starts to pay off. But Loretta's right at the moment. uh, You're not seeing it, but that's not the key for them. Uh, But I do want to know how you respond to the criticism that the Fed has not communicated well uh, what it's thinking and what it's planning, or if not planning, you know, what, what are the potential outcomes? Because we've seen some very wild swings in the markets as data comes around. Uh, have you said data dependent too much? I think there's a misunderstanding of what data dependent means, and that means that I think Chair Powell today will be explaining where he sees policy going, not necessarily at the next meeting, whether 50, 25, which in some sense is really not the big issue. I know for financial markets it it is, but not in terms of monetary policy. It's really, what's the path forward? Are we beginning now to bring policy down? And the pace, of course, and the magnitude eventually of how far interest rates go down, that's going to depend on how the economy evolves, right? But we're going to enter this new phase, I think, and appropriately so. Um, In July, I probably wouldn't have supported actually moving the rate down in July, and of course the committee didn't, but I could have made a case for it. And that's a change, right? That's a, the economy has changed enough. Inflation has come down quite a bit. It's on a path, I think, where we can be pretty confident it'll get back to 2%. And now we really have to balance both sides of the mandate. So it's basically keep the momentum going on inflation at the same time making sure that labor markets remain healthy. What do you think it would take for the committee to decide you needed to do more than the standard 25 basis point cut? So I think it would have to be that, you know, somehow they thought they were a little behind and they needed to catch up. And frankly, I don't see that in the data. I think they're actually in a very good place. Now, if it turns out that, you know, the forecasts are saying, wow, you know, we may be seeing the uh, um, moderation in labor markets being more than moderation, and we actually see a weakening, um, they may have to adjust that and then do more. Um, But I think there's sort of a a record. If you think about when we started to raise rates, right, we started at a 25, then a 50, then we did our 75s. And that's sort of the preferred path because that means, you know, you're not doing too much too ahead of time. And the other thing I think I would be worried about is if you do a 50 to start with, the markets then, you know, build in even more. And I think that's a calibration that you have to think about when you're doing this. So I think being steady, right, thinking about what the right 
pace is geared to how the economy is working and evolving is the right way to go. You said that you expect Jay Powell to come out and give a sense of where we're going. And I think that's actually the frustration for a lot of people in markets. We don't know where we're going. We don't have a sense of what the neutral rate is. Right now, the market has about 200 basis points of rate cuts priced in by the end of next year. Is that appropriate? What is neutral? Well, remember what the markets are doing is, and appropriately so, looking at different scenarios, right? They're waiting. And then when they, when you get those kind of things out of the financial markets about how many rate cuts, it's balancing different scenarios. When the Fed's talking about, you know, where they're seeing it, they're talking about, here's what we think if the economy evolves as we expect would be appropriate policy path. But they also have to think through other alternative scenarios too. So there, it's kind of a different answer or different question, answer to a question. And that's, I think, the frustration is that the Fed is trying to answer a different question is, here's where we see policy going. But of course, they don't want to commit themselves to something because the economy could evolve differently. And that's been hard to communicate. You uh, for, founded an inflation lab at the uh, Cleveland Fed. Uh, what do you think inflation dynamics are now? Is, is this a completely different kind of situation post-pandemic than models coming out of uh, other recessions have, uh, have worked with? Well, I think one thing that we saw during um, the pandemic and the aftermath was that the supply side right, had a lot to do with inflation dynamics. But the key thing to remember is that those supply shocks would not have necessarily resulted in higher inflation if we hadn't had a very strong demand side of the economy. So it's this balance between supply and demand. Typically, right, in the past, right, it was all about demand. Supply, you could sort of say, was sort of stable, and it was all about how demand was moving around. In this event, right, it was both supply and demand, and that made it more challenging. And so in that sense, I think there's a renewed understanding that dynamics on inflation, it's, it's both sides, it's supply and demand, and understanding both I think is going to be a focus going forward. Well, as the Fed goes into its review process for its uh, monetary policy framework, does what happened change the way you think the committee should look at policy? In other words, maybe you want to be a little bit more preemptive than you were? So I know a lot of people characterize the Fed in the, the, the framework that came out in 2020 as being walking away from being preemptive. But if you actually look at the language in there, it still says preemptive. I agree with you that it sounded like we were just being data dependent in the moment, but we always were focused on where is the economy going. So it's data coming in. Assess that data relative to your outlook. If it's materially different than you expect, you might have to change your outlook, and therefore you might have to change policy, your policy, expected policy path. So I think we've always been forward-looking, and I expect the Fed to remain forward-looking. They may change the language in the statement so that that's a little bit more transparent, if you will, so that people actually understand that the policy has to look forward. I would never ask you this question if you're on the watch, but now that you're gainfully retired and in the real world, I'm going to ask you this question. Cleveland has reasonable real estate, but Shaker Heights has a boom <laughs> real estate economy. And part of that asset success of Shaker Heights and the Shaker Heights of America is the gains the haves are getting from this financial system. How does the Fed distribute the benefit more across America rather than this illusion that only the have-nots that own, the haves that own NVIDIA are making way? Yeah, I mean, we, the Fed always focuses on the macro economy, right? It doesn't have tools that can really do much about redistributing or fairness or making sure that everyone gains. But what we can do at the Fed and what they, the new committee will be doing at the Fed is making sure that we maintain healthy labor markets, which again helps distribute um, and brings inflation and price, you know, the, the inflation rate down. And getting back to price stability is also very key to having a strong economy so that everyone can prosper from the economy. The Fed really can't do the other part of what you're talking about, and that's what the federal government policies are about and fiscal policy is about. We thought that you were going to retire and build homes to so try to offset some of the supply issues. Uh, Loretta, there is this uh, question. Uh, Mike was talking about how you're the queen of inflation studies and how the Cleveland Fed really does have, have an incredible metric for that. Do you have a sense of how much more inflationary this post-pandemic economy is? And that really speaks to what is the new neutral? Mm -hmm. 
Well, there are certain factors that really affect inflation, right? But the basics are, are similar to what we saw before, right? Inflation expectations are still an important driver of, of inflation, making sure they remain stable, is helping to keep inflation moving down, which is important. Supply side conditions matter. And labor market tightness matters. We're going to hear a paper at Jackson Hole that's really addressing that, how much tightness in the labor market affects what you might see when demand gets out of whack with supply. So again, right, it's the same basic factors, but of course the supply side during the pandemic changed quite a bit. And those factors are going to become, I think, more significant going forward than perhaps they were in the past. Are you having more fun now that you're not on the committee? I'm having fun. <laughs> well, hopefully you can go hiking or enjoy uh, the beautiful Wyoming. Loretta Mester, formerly of the Cleveland Federal Reserve, uh, just going back to the end of June when you stepped down and she is here for the first time in 10 years. Joining us now is someone who has been in that room, who has seen the decision making and the speech crafting, former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard. Uh, joining us now, uh, Jim, I would love your take on the speech. What did you think of it? I thought this was a good speech. Uh, I thought it was uh, not quite a victory lap, but certainly emphasizing that this policy since 2022 has been extremely effective in bringing inflation down substantially, putting us on a path to 2% inflation without substantial weakening uh, in the labor market. The labor market was super hot. It has cooled, but it's only cooled to uh, a sort of normal labor market. And so that's why everyone's talking about the soft landing. So I think to the extent there are critics uh, out there, which is great, uh, uh, they have to contend with the fact that this policy worked very, very well uh, over the last two years. Jim Bullard, to your acclaimed speech years ago on regimes of a Fed staggering from regime to regime or planning from regime to regime, does this speech signal a new post-pandemic regime? You know, this is going to be studied for years. This episode about uh, 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 disinflation without recession uh, will be studied for many years, and and uh, exactly how it works is is a good question. But Chair Powell said in the speech, I think basically lined out the argument: if you can keep inflation expectations on target. And uh, even when the world seems to be uh, exploding with inflation, then you can get uh, the disinflation to occur relatively rapidly and relatively painlessly. So I think uh, that's a new mode for, uh, for many people in thinking about how monetary policy works. I've been asking this question, Jim Bullard, of many, and with great respect to your public service out of St. Louis, where is the unemployment rate that begins to hurt? For Jim Bullard, I think a lot of America wants to know, what's the statistic in unemployment rate where it says some pain? Is it 5 percent? Is it 4.x percent? Where's that number for Jim Bullard? You know, estimates of the natural rate for most people are in the mid 4% range somewhere. And uh, so I think it's true that unemployment has come up, but it's come up from this, you know, a three handle that it was at for several years. I think what you should think about is that the three handle is the thing that's unusual for the U.S. economy. Four handle would be a very normal right. market turn. And uh, and the now we're at that level. Now, if it goes up from here, if it goes up substantially from here, you know, that's going to be a substantial weakening. And that's why I think uh, uh, Chair Powell didn't want to uh, get any anything further to happen in the labor market. I think he said further cooling is unwelcome. Yeah. Uh, Jim, I, I said Jim Bullard here easily a decade ago with Alan Meltzer of Carnegie Mellon, and he lectured me on the silliness of a 50 basis point uh, move. If we, if we discuss a 50 basis point move, are we defeating all the history of measured and all the value of a gradual approach? Yeah, I just think right now they just probably don't need to go 50 basis points. I think that would... Uh 
you know, trigger expectations about a really rapid uh, pace of uh, uh, rate decline. Uh, they probably don't need to do that. Uh, they would like to asymptote, have the, have the inflation uh, come asymptote down to 2%. Uh, also, you know, basically with this speech and, and certainly with the July meeting as well, uh, they've been heavily signaling that they're going to make this move in September and, and subsequent moves. So that's already been priced in the markets. So they'll just be confirming at the September meeting uh, what's pretty much already happened as far as market pricing. Jim Bullard, the former St. Louis Fed president, thank you so much for being with us. But the real issue is this is a Chairman Powell who at the back end of the speech said now is the time for humility. Yeah, well, there's this a lot of that. I think that's an allusion to the election and the incredibly intense economic policies we're getting both from Trump and Harris. When you I'm just trying to rile up Tom, <laughs> well, Tom I'm just Honig. trying to get it going. Thomas Honig is here. He is. Uh, so let's go to him right now. Former Kansas City Fed Thomas Honig. Uh, I, I'm very curious to see uh, why you actually think maybe it is too soon to sort of sound the all clear and the victory signal that we seem to hear from Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. Well, I understand where he's coming from, first of all. And, I, you know, first of all, we have an economy that is strong but slowing, which is what you want. You have a labor market that has been strong but slowing, as you would expect and want. Uh, and thirdly, you've had relatively tight um, interest rate environment, uh, if you think about it. Uh, interest rates, real interest rates are between two and a quarter and two and three quarter percent. If the equilibrium rate is around two, you're modestly tight, so you would expect a continuation. And that's what he said. We expect to see a continuation in the decline of inflation. So with that in mind, we are getting close to where we can make a cut. So that's the statement. But the fact of the matter is, and here's the catch, inflation at, is between 2.5 and, and 3%. I know they like to use the PCE, but there is a CPI, too. And the CPI really? is 3%. And that's what people index to, and that's what people look at. So inflation is still, if you say 3%, it's 50% above target. So why are you in such a rush? So that's the, that's the counter argument to that. But I, I think based on what he said was, you know, we, we're very close the next move is down and that's what they've been saying for nine months and that gives the the markets kind of a let's if we're going to speculate let's speculate long because the rates are going to go down the heritage of this discussion out of your iowa state economics and all you did in building kansas city is a distrust of those people over in the east coast and maybe the left coast about the debt in the deficit. Yeah. Tom Honig right now, on what you got, you got every every Trump supporter, every Harris supporter is looking at the debt and the deficit and saying, you've got to be kidding me. How afraid of you are the fiscal realities of America folded into our monetary policy? Oh, it's very much folded in. For example, regardless of what they, they do, the deficit is only going to grow. We know the interest on the debt is exploding. We have a, a huge uh, deficit of $2 trillion. It's going to continue to be well above a trillion for some time. So here's the question. Who's going to, who's going to loan them the money? Is it going to be the foreign interest? They're pulling away from the dollar somewhat. Is it going to be domestic? Well, how much do you want to take away from the private sector to fund the debt? Uh, right. And then maybe redo it in some kind of fiscal stimulus, which is less efficient. Or are you going to turn to the Federal Reserve? And I call it I call it knocking on the central bank's door because when you're the only source, if you're going to keep interest right. rates from exploding, the Fed's going it's to have well to print money. It's well reported you've got Krugerrands in your, you know, dresser in your bedroom. <laughs> Gold at 2,500. I mean, we go back to Wayne Angel. We can go back further yeah. than that. The, the primal Midwest economics has got to be screaming about the combination of the debt and the deficit and gold at 2,500. Well, I hope it's more than the Midwest because it, it affects the whole nation. And it, it, is a, it is a very significant problem. You know, the dollar used to be a stable coin, right? Tied wow. to the gold. Tied this is gold. the first. Somebody take a note. Tom <laughs> Hardy right. quoting Bitcoin. <laughs> stable coin. Really? Well, look at it. It was backed by the gold, and therefore you had you had discipline around it. Now it's all fiat, right? Which is fine if your policy is. Can we extend an hour? He's just getting fired up. <laughs> <laughs> look. Well, think about it. That's all I'm asking you to do. Think about it. what's what. What is the discipline 
to the to the value of our currency. It's the FOMC with more and more pressure coming from the size of the debt that we have to, to fund. Someone has to fund that. Not to go too far afield uh, when we're talking about the gold standard. This goes back to the question of inflation yeah. and just how pegged inflation is in this economy that does look different than it did pre-pandemic. Do you have any concerns about the fact that we don't understand neutral and we talk about normalizing policy without a sense of where we're going? Well, I think people know where we're going. And, you know, the estimates are neutral or like every, every other estimate. Uh, it's not certain. But, but many researchers now are saying neutral is around 2 percent. So if neutral is 2 percent and uh, the rate, uh, the Fed funds rate is real rate is two to quarter, two to three quarters percent, you have a tight policy. And the other part of it is, and I will say Chairman Powell emphasizes, is inflationary expectations. So if they can stay firm in terms of we're not going to we're not going to ease so much that we reignite inflation. We don't know what that is, but we know we are somewhere around real rate of two percent. We'll get our rate down to two percent as inflation comes down. And if they move in September, the main thing will be how they message it, because if, if they don't message it right, the markets will immediately start to say, well, what is the next quarter or half percent point? And then you will lose that anchor. I like what you said because it hints to where I was going to go next. Is this a Federal Reserve that wants to see a market rally? Because ultimately that's more supportive of no further deterioration in the labor market. I, th I think this is a Fed that doesn't necessarily want to see a market rally, but it does not want to see inflation reignite, nor does it want to see uh, unemployment start to rise. So they're in that they're in that tight spot, uh, and that's why they're being very careful as they go forward from here. But they they have a lot on their shoulders. There's a state in the vicinity of Tom Honig. It's called Missouri. Yes. McChesney Martin came out of Missouri, yes, Missouri and he and Truman of Missouri had a pitched battle yes. in the early 1950s. Are we going to redux Fed independence battle into 2025? Well, it's yes, it's possible because of the pressure to print money to buy the debt of the U.S. government. And that's when the Fed, I, I think it's hard decisions are ahead of them because I think the Fed's going to have to say, behind the doors, I don't care how they do it, Congress, get your house in order. We cannot carry these kinds of debt forward and, uh, and, and re retain ourselves as the strongest, most reliable currency right. in the world. We're out of time. Can you get Chip Beef on Toast back on the menu at the Pioneer <laughs> Grill? Oh, with all your power, can you get the menu hey, back to what it was? I, I don't, I'm not hosting this anymore, so my power is kind of limited, so I can't promise. How many exits and they put <laughs> avocado can give you, toast I give you my on the menu? <laughs> avocado you toast to Jackson Hole? That's I'm crying. a fan. And former Kansas City Fed President Thomas Honig joining us here in Jackson Hole. From Jackson Hole for our radio and television audiences worldwide, this is a Bloomberg special interview following up on Jay Powell, Fed Chairman's speech here in Jackson Hole. We have Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker joining me, Lisa Abramowitz and Tom Keene. And we'd like to thank you very much, Pat, for coming out, sure. uh, interrupting <laughs> your your seminar. Uh, rumor has it you're going to cut rates. Um, yeah, that's what I hear. Was, was it, you, you've been somewhat what reluctant uh, are you on board no I, I'm I said the last couple days that it's time to start a process and I think it's a process it's not about a particular number the process needs to be dictated by the data we see but we need to start moving rates down no question about it well if you start moving rates down the one thing that didn't come through in the speech is by how much yeah and again, I think we need to let the data dictate this. I think what matters more than a particular number. Now, I've been out and about my district all summer uh, talking to contacts. And one thing I heard is 25, 50, it, that doesn't matter so much as commit to a process, be methodical about the process. <clears throat> In particular, because what I've heard particularly from the bankers is uh, they need time to absorb the changes. So don't just stop and start. Don't just do a, a, lar a large decrease and then stop and then start again. Just start a process and keep it moving.
This, to me, really uh, underscores what Loretta Mester was saying, uh, formerly of the Cleveland Federal Reserve, where it makes sense for the Federal Reserve to go by 25 basis points to begin with, and yeah. then potentially cut yeah. more uh, significantly later on, because then you're not signaling to markets that you're going to go much further. Is yeah. that what you agree? Yeah, and we'll, we'll see how things, you know, there are a lot of risks still out there in the economy, in the global economy. So we start with 25, and we just let it run and keep moving. That, and we're already seeing it, right? We're seeing the long end of the curve start to come down. Uh, that's been good. The mortgage business is back. You talk to bankers, they're starting to write mortgages again. That's all good news for the economy. I've got to ask the engineer the question. Susan Collins was, was channeling Patrick Harker here the other day. She mm -hmm. says, we need to lose the pessimism. We need to be more optimistic about where we are right now. What do you, you, you more than anyone I know, listens to business. Yeah. What are you hearing from business about investment next year, about their confidence forward? Yeah, they're cautiously optimistic, I would say, right now. I think they are optimistic, but depends on the industry um, and depends on where they are in their own business cycle, right? But yeah, generally we're seeing, take housing, for example. Housing's a good example. We know that a lot of developers are sitting on their hands waiting for rates to come down for this process to start. I think that's a good thing because we need them to build affordable houses, low, moderate income houses. And I think they will do that as we start this process. When the chairman spoke today, he suggested that the balance of risks has changed. Inflation is yeah. coming down, and it's probably not going to shoot up again because of the rising unemployment rate. But the rising unemployment rate, in turn, is a bigger risk at this point. How much of a risk do you see of a downturn yeah. from unemployment? So I don't see a large outside risk. The employment, unemployment can go up some, right? And it probably will go up a little bit. Uh, it will definitely, in our view, not peak above, say, 5%. I mean, it will be below that for sure. No, not for sure. We never, nothing's for sure. Uh, but you got to look at the totality of the data, too. It's not just about that number, right? It's about what we're hearing uh, from our contacts, the claims data, the job-to-job -job transition data. There's a host of data you have to look at. Well, this is a confidence question. Recessions are always a yeah, confidence sure. question. You're talking about confident CEOs that the business is going to be okay. But what do you hear from the average person who could pull back if they see the unemployment rate going up? It really is a tale of two consumers uh, to simplify things. Those who have the money or spending the money, they're not that concerned. Low, moderate income households are really still feeling the pain. They're feeling the pain of housing prices, food prices, you name it. So they are very concerned. So it really depends. It's not one size fits all. There's not the average consumer. That person doesn't exist in our economy. So everyone's talking about this process, right? You talked about that too. This is yeah. the beginning of a process. One thing uh, that Neil Dunn noticed was missing was the word gradual from Jay Powell's speech. We can get to that in a second. Do you have a sense of where we're heading? Yeah, so I like the word methodical. That's what I'm hearing from my contacts. Please just make it <laughs> so that we know where you're going in a a very clear way, and then you start that process, and don't just stop and start, as I said earlier. So where are you going? Well, we're going to go back to whatever that new neutral rate is. Well, do right? we have an idea of what that could be? Yeah, I mean, we don't know exactly what it is. We'll know it when we get there. Let's be honest. You can't know it a priori. Right. But, yeah, you know, it's probably around something around 3%-ish or, you know, somewhere around there. But we don't know that for sure. One of the new things of social media is wonderful people. There's a guy named Triple Net Investor that's out there revealing empty office buildings trading for next to nothing. Right. I got good news. Philadelphia is not on the latest list of this city, that city, and the other city. From where you stand and from all your contacts, and Philadelphia's led on this, where are we on the washout and cleanup yeah. of commercial real estate? Again, let's, commercial real estate isn't a one-size-fits-all thing. So downtown office is what we're talking about. The dentist in the suburban office mall is doing just fine, right? It's that downtown office space. We are starting to see that clean out some. It's a pro again, it's going to take some time. Uh, whether it's new businesses moving into that space at much lower rents or conversion. We're seeing a lot of conversion activity as well. Do you have a confidence that the banking uh, industry is resilient to that conversion? That so far, yes, I do. But it's something we clearly need to keep our eye on. 
Well, sticking with real estate, let's talk about the residential side. You were optimistic yeah. at the start of the interview here, talking about mortgages coming back. There's been a lot of criticism of the Fed maybe breaking the mortgage market because interest rates rose above the, what the majority of people yeah. had for their mortgage rate. Yeah, yeah. Do you have an idea of what level housing it takes for, for housing to come back? And does that figure into your calculations of yeah. where neutral should be? Yeah, so we, did, we had to do what we did to get inflation under control. So I don't, no apologies that we took rates up quickly. I think about my generation, the baby boomers, the largest generation to go into retirement. We're sitting on these low mortgages. We want to move. We don't want that big house anymore. That lock-in effect, it will start to ease as rates come down. And we're already starting to see a, a little bit of that. Again, I talked to the bankers, they're writing mortgages again, not just refis, but they're writing new mortgages again. That combined with the new supply that'll come on the market, I'm pretty optimistic Mike, that we can is, get there. This is a critical statement from Mr. Harker, the idea of like, when the rate comes down, where does the fever step in again? Are you looking in Jackson? <laughs> it would take a lot. It would take a lot. <laughs> it would yeah. take a lot for that to happen. Uh, another question that comes up now that you're essentially starting the path to rate right. cuts is what do you do about the balance sheet? Because in theory, they work in opposition yeah. to each other. And it had been sort of the Fed's policy that we wouldn't do them simultaneously. But it looks like you're going to be doing that. Yeah, and that's OK. I think, again, we I've always been in the camp of putting the balance sheet on autopilot, essentially starting the process letting it run until we get and get there. We definitely don't know exactly where that's going to end. The data will dictate when we end that process. I'm OK with doing that because I, it's in the background. It's running. We need to get back to ample reserves. We don't know what that number is, but we'll know it when we Have get you got there. an estimate of, uh, about when that might be? I do. But I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> because it's so uncertain. It's so, we had an estimate last time we did this, right? And we were off. So I'm cautious about that. If he told you, he'd have to kill you. I think that there's this question uh, right now about heading into year end. And Adam Posen was really highlighting this earlier. There's this anxiety about what the fiscal backdrop will do to uh, derail some of the calm, the methodical aspects of yeah. Fed policy. I don't know that you can or want to comment on, on basically what that policy could be. But how much does that keep Fed officials up at night? How much is that part of the discussion, what you have to do to uh, respond to any potential expansion of the deficit that could be inflationary next year? So I stay out of fiscal policy, obviously. But and, you have to respond to it. But we have to respond it, yes. to it, exactly. And so I can't speak for the Fed either, but for myself. What keeps me up are many risks. That's one of them, right? There's also, uh, if we see what we're seeing around the world, these conflicts get worse. Uh, I mean, that would be tragic, the humanitarian tragedy alone, but the tragedy also to the economy, the, the hurt to the economy. So there are a lot of risks that keep me up at night. That's just one of them. Well, but do tariffs worry you more or the deficit? Depends. Uh, it depends. <laughs> the devil's in the detail. Like, what's specific about the tariffs? What specifically we're investing in in terms of deficit? Um, you know, I, I'm a simple guy. I think if... if we're investing in something that's improving the productivity of the American economy. That's a good thing. If we're spending money that doesn't do that, that worries me more. So, again, it's not just one one thing. It really depends on what we're doing. Well, you mentioned productivity. We had the big revision to the non-farm payrolls right. this week. But that should raise productivity. Do you view that as good news offsetting the bad news of lower yeah, job that's creation? An interesting, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. Yeah. We were expecting this uh, adjustment. Uh, we, we looked at, uh, you know, in the Philly Fed, we've been looking at this, the payroll adjustments, and we knew this was coming. It was a little larger than we expected, but we knew it was coming. So that wasn't a surprise. And it's still a good number overall. If you average out over 12 months, we're still doing just fine in the American economy. But there's risk there. That's why we need to start to take action now. Well, we'll see you on September 18th. Patrick Harker, president of the Philadelphia Fed, thank you very much for joining us on Bloomberg Radio and Television. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. 
Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.